Welcome everyone, Grand Gnosis Master Dr. Thor Tentmalar here, and we're going to talk about an interesting book on a very important uh, researcher um, who um, has uh, did a fantastic, a lifetime work of research. He's a famous uh, British ghost hunter and paranormal researcher, particularly with mediums and uh, every other area as well. And this is a real fascinating book. The name of it is Harry Price, Ghost Hunter by Paul Tabori. The uh, Dennis Weekly Library of Occult, which is a, um, these were published in the, well, this edition was written in the 50s, uh, but this was republished in the 70s at the height of uh, interest in occultism. Of course, Dennis Wheatley is a famous uh, novelist that writes particularly about demonic things, but it's very interesting. Um, this is one of those very overlooked people, Harry Price, who I was not acquainted with at all. But I mean, if you go back into the 100 years plus, there's almost 150 years of research into all things metaphysical. You can call them a cult, uh, depending on what you're looking at. Cult only means hidden. Uh, so the whole idea is that... Um, there was an explosion of interest in this area caused by World War I, where an entire generation of British was annihilated and uh, repeated in World War II because you never learned the first time and repeated again as they joined the EU, hopefully getting out. But why not? <laughs> Forget and forget when they murdered your entire family. But let's go on to more interesting things. So when we get into, um, I had no idea of this person who um, reminds me very much of uh, the guild itself and myself personally. He's kind of a person who's not part of any particular mysticism community. Uh, I am not a person involved in religion. I am not part of a religious magical organization. Uh, on the other hand, I'm also not a scientific person because I believe that stuff is just as comic book as so many mystical, magical religions are. It's fraud. It doesn't work. Science and numbers don't explain everything. So it's ridiculous to base your life in that, just as it's ridiculous to base your life in comic book religions and comic book belief systems of spirits doing everything and helping uh, on every single area or hindering. There's a mixture of all this, and we need to be well aware of that as we um, go through our different um, research. Well, this guy was a serious researcher. Coming from a wealthy family, he collected one of the largest occult libraries and theatrical magic libraries uh, at the time because daddy was a wealthy man. And uh, I forget the exact business he was in, in but he later was um, ran the business and served as a advisor and a corporate running of the business uh, probably all his life. That whole area was in detail and it's not really important, but it is important the fact of how did he survive. And this is always a problem with this area of research is that there's no money there. There's very little money in any research and everybody goes from grant to grant to keep their uh, livelihood going. Now, he was able to start his own paranormal investigative organizations because he did have money. He worked with other organizations as well and kind of walked the golden mean road that I always stress so much, the center smart world. So, which means he got great criticism from both sides. And uh, I really think that that's uh, where the actual guild stands today is that uh, uh, we are not into mumbo jumbo, uh, both of science or of occultists who claim that they can do anything when they are put to the test can do very little. And science certainly can't even solve or cure, let's say, acne. Pretty sad. Here we are uh, in the 21st century. We don't have a cure for acne or let's throw in dandruff. We have treatments to control these things, not cures. And those treatments tend to be pretty poor. So as we move into this, Harry Price was a great person. He built up this huge library, which was difficult there. Over 3,000 books on all sorts of matters, uh, scientific, occult, and otherwise. Fantastic library, um, which uh, was eventually donated to the University of London, apparently is where it sits today. Uh, I don't know if anybody can access it or not. Usually, if you're some sort of researcher, you can access it. Um... These are always another way of keeping uh, things um, out.
out of the public view and only to certain people. Why? Another uh, problem with the world in general and why uh, so many uh, research goes nowhere because you can't access what everyone else did before. He was a great tinkerer, inventor, was uh, excellent with machines and electronics, and built many different ghost hunting type apparatuses and testing devices. And um, <clears throat> for a quite a number of years, basically his entire life until the day he died, I believe in 1948, uh, or six, and uh, he was involved in investigations of all types. And uh, uh, he was disliked because he was open-minded by the, uh, which apparently seems to be the tradition that goes on today where the magicians, uh, with their mediocre uh, scientific background, uh, were investigating people that were using, quote, magic tricks to fool people that looked like real magic. Um, so he was a member of all these magic clubs and was a professional magician himself to a degree. He just didn't find that his greatest interest, but he trained himself for years in that and read every possible book he could find on it. Now, we just remember the time frame here is because he, he died in 1946 or 8, uh, he was mostly uh, active in the really big years of particular um, spiritualism and mediumships, which followed World War I. So we're talking about uh, what is uh, 1920 um, uh, on up after uh, World War II ended in 1918, I believe. And of course, soon after that, everybody was going to mediums to talk to the millions that were murdered in World War I uh, because of the horrible grief that that brought. And of course, uh, we are talking about a huge amount of people. This isn't one of the new wars here where we have lost uh, a few thousand or even Vietnam, which was 60,000 over 10 years with uh, hundreds of thousands wounded. Uh, we're talking about um, hundreds of thousands of uh, people that died and left this giant chunk in everybody's reality. So there's a great shift from all which we are having ourselves today now for the disillusionment of so-called proper religions, which do absolutely nothing for you. And as such, people not only have rejected them, which has been going on for 30, 40 years, they have now turned to the other side and they believe that Satanism is the answer. After all, that controls everything in their mind. So there was this huge interest in spiritualism and that's why this kicked off, meaning talking to the dead. So this was a giant, giant business, and you can imagine why, and, you know, it alleviates a lot of suffering if people can talk to their relatives uh, and know that they're okay. So, I mean, in a way, spiritual even, even at its uh, fake level, its totally fraudulent level, uh, I think serves a great need uh, to that individual if they feel they actually have talked to a relative and know they're okay. Seems to me that serves a great purpose, a lot more than going and seeing a goofy magic trick show um, or some sort of movie or other entertainment or spending an hour in a church somewhere that's going to leave you with a giant, empty, rotting soul. So uh, I think it uh, did a lot for people. The problem is we always hear what I call gypsy magic. Gypsy magic is those that are frauds that steal money from you. Uh, they continually ask you for more money. Um, this is what uh, the um, rotting uh, fungus of uh, some lower level occultists do. And it's been a way people have been making money out of occultism for years. It works off of fear. You're cursed. If we don't take it off you, you're going to die. Um, I can help you with this, but we need uh, more money for me to find out if your relative is alive. These are the type of things that getting a psychic reading, getting a true spiritualist who may have some contact with, uh, which could be your relatives. I think all these things which are real and positive are good for people. Um, it can be argued uh, going to Christian medicine tent practitioners uh, that promise healings uh, as Benny Hinn does uh, and has been doing for 30 years uh, who drives Mercedes Benz is of much of a value from what I understand from different specials and reports on that. Um, he has no cases of curing anybody, which is almost shocking, <laughs> including his own brother who's a diabetic. But does that help people? Well, I think it does, as long as they aren't into 
Uh, you know, there are practical things you should do, and a God, if you believe in that, will send you to get a pill you need to take a vitamin, to think that he's going to intervene directly, which is what these people tend to be told, I think can be dangerous if you're sick. <laughs> but how many people are cured? I'll tell you right now, the success rate of curing cancer and other things is fairly pathetic. So doctors promise you a lot under the guise of the fraud of science, and they deliver very little. What they don't deliver very little of is the cost, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they lose. You die and the bill is still there. So what does that mean? That means a lot of fucky shit. <laughs> Plain and simple. So uh, everyone understanding this, this is a very critical area of belief to get into. So to criticize mediums like these uh, faker occultists that go out there calling themselves skeptics and debunkers, uh, like the famous um, Brian Dunning, who just stated in one of his little things that he believes in Jesus. <laughs> How scientific of you, Brian Dunning. You're a real scientific skeptic, someone who has not been mentioned in any written document from any culture whatsoever in the history of time. Not one word about this Jesus dude. But I guess that's scientific then. But of course, you know, it just shows you how skeptics operate. And of course, um, the reason I bring that up he also thinks that it's okay to uh, fraudulently put cars through. You've got on the side of Volkswagen, who one of the cr most criminal organizations on the planet, who has put together, uh, pushed through a bunch of their cars uh, and emission controls uh, because, of course, they had no technology. The Germans only make what they can steal from others. So another fallacy that people don't understand. You know, maybe the skeptics should be looking into the fallacies of life, religions, the lies about corporations, medicines, and even the lies about certain countries like Germany who are ass backwards and who are nothing more than a criminal state. So, but you'll never hear them talk about any of that or corruption in general. They want to go after some poor psychic person who's trying to make a few bucks uh, who mostly are sincere or it's what they're doing may be helping people quite directly. Now, so most of his research was this 1920s up through a very active 20s and 30s where spiritual movement was very big. And so was the other things. People looked the other way from tradition because of the horrors of war. Little did they know they're going right back into it because they allowed psychos to reorganize. Um, and um, plain and simple, there was a great birth here, and apparently there was money to support this. The spiritualists, because this was so popular and such a money maker, and why not? Hollywood's been making money off of fraud and government and doctors and lawyers for since they've been evolved. It's all fraud. You go to a doctor, pay them a lot of money, and it's throw a coin in the air. Will you survive or not? Same thing with an attorney. Well, we know that's a 50-50 loss. Somebody's got to lose. So the whole idea is that all this uh, and why uh, certain other areas should be um, harassed because of their lack of um, perfect information or delivering of things is a big question. So, um, and whether someone put on a good show or not, so what? Maybe they had contact with relatives and they still put on a show. Certainly that makes the whole thing very interesting, doesn't it? So I have a problem with this in general, but like most things, uh, doctors should make no claims, lawyers should make no claims, politicians, military police, none of them should make claims or call themselves um, law enforcement when they enforce criminal profits or doctors who are in the death business, not the life business. So I don't think that uh, anyone should make any claims, including spiritualists, occultists. Here's the information, take it for what you want. Uh, the problem is when it comes into extorting people, but isn't that what a doctor does? You have cancer and you got to go in there for all these treatments. Several doctors, as of late, who knows how long they've been pulling the shenanigans, have told people they have cancer when they don't. They give them expensive treatments, they make a lot of money, and they're magically in remission. <laughs> well, they never had it in the first place. So uh, all this goes on, but you know, we, we need to understand this. And I'm taking a little more time with this book because it covers a lot of important areas that you should know if you're interested in this area. So he did a lot of research and of course he tested mediums after mediums and so did a whole bunch of other people. 
And uh, as he said, he was a member of the spiritualist community as uh, their clubs, and he was a member of the scientific and the magic club. So he was in all these and got ridiculed by all of them because they didn't lie. When he came out in favor of certain spiritualists, which seemed to have been a really direct contact, uh, the magicians jumped on his back and the spiritualists loved him. When he unmasked a faked spiritualist, the spiritualists hated him and his buddies with that. So very typical of the flip flop. And now the reason I mentioned that. And this is a fantastic book for people to read if they want to understand the politics of parapsychology. I hate that term, but we have to use something everybody understands. Here's the politics of this entire. And if you think anything was different back in olden, better times, you know, things were better back then, you're wrong. The same problems that we have today, the same kind of kooks, flakes, and weirdos in the mag in the theatrical magic community and the scientific community and the same kind of frauds that push things in the occult community are all the same they are today. And we're now talking um, approximately 100 years ago when a lot of this research was done. So 1920 to today, well, that's about 100 years. So uh, nothing has changed one iota. It's still the same old game, the same old people unmasking others. So um, certainly there's a lot. Of, there's, when there's a lot of money in anything, you have a lot of fraud. And there was a lot of money in spiritualism. People were giving people the show. Now, I would have to see these things and to what degree if there wasn't psychic things happening. A lot of things were fraud. They did everything, or at least most spiritualists did things in totally darkened rooms. So you really never knew what they were doing. You couldn't see anything. This, of course, is just an open invitation for all sorts of fraud. But fraud based in what? So um, if they are giving good information or even a hope to a certain degree, is that fraud? So we have to be careful. And secondly, are they giving it? If someone says, this is your relative, Bob, I'm fine. Things are good over here. Are you going to pay for that? Well, you may. You may pay a little bit. If a chair flies around the room, if a trumpet is blown, if lights come on mysteriously, if tables move, if there are rats, wrappings on the walls and other places, well, you're going to pay a lot more for it. You just had one hell of an adventure. And remember, everything in life is based on money. So, um, so needless to say, there is massive corruption and fraud in every segment of our society to pinpoint spiritualist psychics or is going for the weakest level of people when you have the highest corruption by doctors, lawyers, and police, police who shoot people in the back on the streets. Yet nothing is there. Amazing Randy didn't come out and say, Oh, terrible, they just shot this guy in the back six times. And we have it on film. Where was he? Oh, this psychic guy here, you know, I was in one of my, uh, on the phone with one of my uh, recorded sex prostitutes. And I heard this story, and I just ignored it. Well, it's ridiculous. These people aren't seeking out injustice in every area. They're seeking out by their corporate paid interest to discredit people of empowerment so that they don't gain power. And secondly, he is going against his competition. If all psychics are frauds and putting on games, what are they doing? They're pen and tellers, aren't they? Aren't they competition to you? Isn't that bleeding money? from you? Well, that's right. And of course, that's why Houdini was so popular or was so out there going after mediums. It was taking away from his business. His fraud about his mother and everything else is nonsense. This was nothing more than a business proposition. He wasn't seeking truth. He was seeking to destroy so that his business would prosper because the spiritualist movement was hurting the magical, um, theatrical magical industry dramatically people were going to seances not to magic shows and he wasn't very good at close-up magic he was an escape artist and that is a difficult way to make a lot of money he couldn't go in theaters easily he stated this himself and wished he had the talents of other magicians of his types 
So all of this needs to be fully understand. But this book goes into that. Now let's go into, uh, he, uh, since he was a fair and proper researcher, through his career he found very legitimate proof of people who were mediums, people who had psychic abilities and abilities in general. He confirmed them. Lots of them? No. He found a lot of frauds, which I'm assuming is the case today. Well, I find a lot of frauds with doctors, lawyers, and police I go to are nothing but corrupt pigs that hurt my life a lot more than some little medium. So is this shocking? Well, certainly it is. And when you don't have an organized group of, and we can solve this problem very easily by having, and I will document this in another audio, of the fact that you can have, if you organize an international research organization of people who are not affiliated with anybody, both magicians, regular people like myself, who has 50 years in this industry, as well as scientists to put test people and pay them while they're testing, not like they abused Yuri Gellard, paid him nothing, and wanted him to spend weeks researching him over and over again to do the same stupid little odd things without paying him anything. We need to pay these people for their time, and then in this day and age where we have multiple cameras and other ways, there's no way really anybody can cheat. And if you have people from different areas, they can point out things that may be going on. It's not hard. But why would anybody put themselves through that if they're not being paid for it? Anybody that goes through any study is paid for it. There are companies that will pay you to try products to give your opinion, to go through testing of some sort of product or drug. They pay you, and some quite handsomely. People have to be paid if you expect them. Why would you possibly go through that? Especially in this day and age where it doesn't get you anywhere. Well, SRI Institute tested me and I'm real. Who cares? Didn't I test that other guy that was a fake? What is the benefit? Nothing. So, I'm for testing people because uh, to prove this is real. I know it's real. Let's prove it. But let's not prove it on, on uh, your dime who has the empowerment. Let's prove it on my dime. So it wouldn't cost much. Maybe the cost of a few tanks a year. We could put up an international institute, bring people in from around the world, test them and say, this could have fantastic benefits for society. If we find out a person with healing ability, well, what makes that happen? Maybe we can trigger that in everyone. Wouldn't that be great? Or would it be? For the doctors? For the $50 billion cancer industry a year? Not much benefits, is it there, Randy? So as we move into all those uh, understandings, we need to fully. So he did find and he proved that mediumship is real. Now, this was that, what amuses me is that we've uh, a institute in Arizona now who's ran by um, a woman there who escapes my the name right now, has written a couple of books on this. She has verified mediumship is real too. Uh, do we need that? Harry Price was an idiot. Well, I don't think we really needed any of that. Not only that, he wrote copious documents on all of this, was a fantastic writer and documentation. We didn't really need money spent on that. Apparently, she was able to get a grant and money to study this. So he proved it was a fact. Not that lots of them, but some were shockingly real. But let's get into a whole bunch of other things he investigated, particularly the Borley Manor, a most haunted place in England, uh, who he rented for an entire year uh, and collected awesome amount of data on the very strange happening. You know, when we go to certain places like that today, nobody seems to be able to produce things. Uh, the guy who... Um, is the uh, moderator and runs Ghost Adventures now, which has been on for like 15 years, bought a haunted house and produced nothing from it. Of course, he doesn't know anything. He has no background. Uh, another movie producer that thinks he's some sort of paranormal expert. But um, he recorded massive amounts of phenomena. He also brought a whole bunch of other people in to witness the same thing. 
uh, spirit apparitions, seeing things moving around, the typical noises, the moving of things. He confirmed all this without. So I guess some drunken guy out of a pub somewhere came over in the night and snuck in his house and made things move around because, you know, you got all that time and money to do that. <laughs> After that, we went out and made crop circles for six hours a night. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, a good cuppa and a little bit of brew can get you going all night. What nonsense. So, as we uh, fully understand, they're ridiculous, but he proved it. The other thing he proved, beyond a shadow of a doubt, was dowsing. He brought in top dowsers. They found ponds, lakes underneath the ground. They found all kinds of water everywhere and did this without a single miss. Every time. And he did this with three or four top dowsers. And there isn't, um, he's writ copiously on this and proved that dowsing is real. So he proved that. He proved that ghost and poltergeist phenomenon in, in general was extremely real and totally and completely unexplainable uh, by normal conditions. So this is very, very exciting that he has come to these conclusions. Now, spiritualism, mucked and mired as it is, uh, was very difficult, but there were real spiritualists or people that at times uh, could draw in these things. Well, the problem with most of these people who want to be taken seriously and also need to make a living is that at times when their abilities uh, went into uh, zero, and this happens with all occultists, is that there are times when you just don't seem to have any energy for one reason or another and you just can't do anything uh, magically. Uh, well, what do you do when you have to make a living? What do you do if you're doing a reading tomorrow? Well, you fake it. That's how it goes, just like your doctor fakes that he's going to heal you when you go to him. So all of these are the realities that we need to look at to understand the bigger picture. But reading this is like reading the last 20 years of fake attacks by people who uh, have an axe to grind and most likely in modern times uh, are financed to do things like uh, James Randi and his organization, which get numerous donations from a bunch of people and have a very strange board of directors, which include... Uh, fake uh, internet millionaires and military officers. What are they doing there? How bizarre. Not to mention the fact that the main skeptics and debunkers are pretty much the most low-life people you're going to leave. A clown college graduate that's a juggler. A Latin high school teacher, a convicted felon, and a guy who didn't even graduate high school and has... Um, problems with several moral charges against him. These are your debunkers. Shy. Now, if the people on the other side had this, you would never hear them screaming, but parapsychologists seem to be the most wimpiest, cowardice people on the planet who don't go head-to-head -head with liars and deceivers who make things up plain and simple, which has been proven in many of the different cases. So this, but it's very interesting to read that the same problems we're having today as we had before. Uh, even in the same camps, people fight among themselves. Why people who are of science can credit somebody one time as being powerful and the next not, we don't know. And why one person with an excellent scientific and uh, good mind uh, is tricked and the same person goes to someone else and they say, well, this person's the real thing. We don't know why. People criticize Conan Doyle for this. Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of uh, Sherlock Holmes, another who was a medical doctor and also a war doctor, quite a fascinating man. A lot of people uh, said that he was uh, too gullible. Um, and it may be to some extent that he would um, uh, give certain people credit. Uh, and I think we, any serious person does this. You want the people to uh, have these abilities, and we should do everything possible to make sure they can perform them, but we should not, of course, enter into fraud and deception, obviously. That doesn't serve anybody. Um, but when it came to a doubt, um, if you're in the field, you want to give the doubt to the person who's performing for you and not just, well, we're not sure you're, you're a fraud. Well, that isn't even, I think, a quite 
proper statement. So you tend to give people more credit, and I think that may have been the case. It's hard to say. Uh, Doyle was a medical doctor. He had great training. He did lots of investigation. He worked with a lot of spiritualists, and I don't believe he was married to one. Uh, I don't believe that this had he was living in a fraud. He didn't need the money. What was the point of it? So he believed what his wife was doing. He believed the process. And was it exacting? No. Should you hold exacting standards to something that is inexact? Uh, you don't. You have to. Some things are conjecture. So what is all that? Certainly the fraud committed by Houdini and the rest of his clan, uh, the mason and son of a rabbi that he was, um, is certainly something to be under suspicion in itself. So as we move into these things, I highly recommend that everybody read this book to get that. First of all, it shows what he actually proved and is real and highly documented. The other politics of it, to show you how bad this is, and this was repeated in the late uh, 1970s or early 80s with Arthur Kessler, a famous uh, investigator and a writer who uh, apparently made a lot of money from his books. He wrote the... Um, highly recommended book, um, um, which escapes me right now, but we have required reading. He talks about this. He talks about the realities of uh, parapsychology. So Arthur Kessler um, made a lot of money from different novels and other things he wrote. Um, he again was discredited, uh, interesting, after his death and even uh, shortly before that because he was apparently sexually aggressive, meaning that he actually got some in his life. So these are the type of attacks that are on people as well, uh, which are unwarranted. Uh, so the point is, is that um, um, what happened there is the same thing that happened as I will end this talk to Harry Price, which is beyond even kind of comprehension. Uh, is the fact that um, nobody wanted to set up a parapsychology division in any of the colleges that were approached uh, by Kessler's estate because he left the money so it would go there. I believe Oxford, University of London, and others turned it all down. Only, uh, I believe it's the University of Edinburgh uh, where finally took his money and has a parapsychology unit running with his funding. Um, you can go online and actually find that. It's the Arthur Kessler Foundation, and they'll direct you towards that, um, uh, which does seem to be semi-active, even though from what I've read of it, uh, they have some bizarre belief systems that don't seem to be very rooted in true paranormal uh, study, and they even have a uh, which I'm not sure is good or bad, but his attitude is pretty poor. They have a professional magician on their board and uh, who writes really bad stuff that misinterprets the facts, which is typical of these magicians because they have already come to their conclusion they're not seeking the truth. That's the key to everything in life, people. You seek the truth. So, um... So there's a great problem there. Finally, they took it over, and I don't know what else. I don't know how much money he left them, and I'm not sure. Uh, I'm assuming he left papers and other things that that school now has. Um, Harry Price had a big, big problem here. He offered his 3,000-book library in the late 1920s, early 30s. Uh, he wanted to give it to several different schools, including the spiritualists, and because he didn't uh, scream the company line, meaning agree with uh, their policies, they didn't want anything from him. He also had a complete laboratory of equipment. The wealth of knowledge and uh, unique equipment that he could uh, offer to them was staggering. He even offered to pay them to all the shipping, all the setup, and I believe even a certain maintenance fee. He had lots of money, basically, uh, from his uh, corporate interests. So, this was not good enough for anybody. They all turned him down. Even the University of London, who eventually accepted it, was very hesitant to accept it. So, you can't even give it away. 3,000 books, all that information, and nobody cares. Sad. Because science is so great.
like the great science we have of automobile technology today batteries <laughs> yeah. from 1870 batteries we now run our cars <laughs> 150 year old technology it's absurd but the point is is that um nobody wanted it he went all over europe trying to give it to the germans they wouldn't take it none of the brits would I believe even an Italian uh, scientific organization was offered it, but nobody would accept it for one reason or another. I'm not sure what bringing an English, of course, he had books in all languages, but uh, giving English language books to foreign uh, countries probably isn't the wisest thing to do anyway. Well, uh, finally, uh, the University of London took his massive library, and they have it today of something. Maybe someday I'll report on that. But... Arthur Kessler had the same problem. Even if you're setting up, even if you have the money there, nobody is interested in doing the, the studies if they're an actual uh, university. Because for a while, I can certainly understand it. There's nobody there that knows anything. Um, only Duke University has some sort of program going uh, who probably would welcome a donation like this of today. And of course, there's some private organizations out there, Noetic Studies and other ones probably would jump at the opportunity to get something like this today. But, you know, they weren't around then. Even in Arthur Kessler's time, and I'm not sure when that process started, as I said, I'm not sure exactly when he died, but most of these things weren't going then, and of course, um, these are generally American-based, and I'm assuming they wanted to get somebody going in the UK somewhere. Uh, so it just shows you how never, ever does anything change. If you expect anything to change, if you expect 100 years from now uh, that there's anything new out there or special to offer to the public, well, you're a fool. It ain't going to happen. Nothing changes. We don't have anything. We have a phone book that's on a little chip in your phone. Is that good or bad? I don't know. I kind of enjoyed looking through the phone book and finding unusual things from restaurants to others. Pretty hard to do that on those little stinking little phones or even on your computer. Are these progresses? Is a phone that you carry around with you instead of being hooked to a wire a great improvement, a high technology? Ah, ah, not in my book. The fact that your, home, your phone also has a watch in it, ah, ah, I like my separate watch. And I got alarms on that too, including a calculator in it. What's the problem? So, this is not technology, people. So, um, the suppression of this type of information is the suppression of what information will take us up to the next level of reality and change all the problems we have. We're not going to get that from crappy old technology that basically, as with all technology, usually takes close to 50 years from inception to general public use. This has not changed in the modern world. Yes, you can get new software out and this may do something relatively quickly. It is not a great solving of anything. I can't think of a single problem that so-called new technology has solved. The only thing that is quite nice and is faulty at some times, and people have even died by following it, is GPS map coordinates. Go down the road and it says turn here, next exit. I think this is fantastic technology and very helpful instead of reading a map which is dangerous and difficult. Certainly that's a good tool that is, and I'm sure there's others, but the rest of it is just a clock and a ring and an alarm that's in a damn phone. Certainly isn't a much of a uh, great backup here for anybody. These are not great breakthroughs. They are not big helps for us. Plain and simple. They are nonsense technologies that have replaced other technologies which could even hurt manufacturing business. I mean, how many people are buying uh, cameras and uh, alarm clocks anymore? Well, it's greatly reduced. I would assume these things will disappear in years to come. They're just leftovers for older people. And as they die off, there'll be more and more problems involved. So what do we do with all this? So 
suppression of this we need to investigate the human consciousness what makes people tick how can we make people uh, less corrupt and how can they be functioning at a higher level and how can we have technologies that really do something instead of technologies that are garbage well here's the problems we run into and it's laid out how here's a guy who tried who was uh, appeared to be from what I can tell a uh, hundred percent honest person seeking truth and to think that there are no provable mediums, provable psychic power is nonsense. We've proven psychic power. We've proven healers. We've proven mediumships, not only back then, but even in modern time. We have 150 years of proving this technology is real. It works. The reason why it is not uh, out in the public is nobody wants to arm the public with powerful tools to upset the cookie cart. Nobody wants to accept the cookie cart. They want to keep the status quo and they don't want to empower the individual. This breeds a highly corrupt society that we have now and nothing happens and you pay the price for it. You die young. You watch people in your family die of illnesses because the information and the technologies to heal them has been depressed suppressed. You get a dirty, filthier, crappier world because they bring you corrupt technologies when we don't need them. It goes on and on and on. And here it shows you. Here it was, the same thing going on in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. No different. Absolutely none whatsoever. At least there were people interested back then of some credibility and organizations that supported them. We have some of that now. But these people, of course, Harry Price was extremely well known. Uh, he was in the regular newspapers. He was everywhere. He, I don't know how many books he published and pamphlets. We don't see any of this from any of our other people. Some people put out some books now. Um, um, Dean Radin and others, and of course, you know, all these people are in their late 60s now, uh, have put books out, people do things on YouTube, but I mean, they're really not getting to the masses or getting into the public media. These people were in the public media and they don't seem to be standing up for anybody or anything. They are not aggressive enough, yet everybody knows the name of James Randi, the unamazing Everybody knows Penn and Teller. People quote him as some authority. I just heard another person who said, well, we saw this on Penn and Teller, how psychics are all idiots. The juggler clown school graduate? He dropped out of high school. I mean, these people are... You know, you don't necessarily have to be educated, but I mean, there's a difference between not even getting your high school diploma... And, of course, having money to go back to this. Well, he's not going to do that. He's only worried about making money. Everything he does is about promoting his own show. And, of course, you're not going to promote your show saying, I'm a good Christian. Well, who's going to listen to you, Penn? Who's going to listen to you if you say you're a Democrat? No, I'm an independent. Oh, I don't believe in God. What? Huh? That gets you right on the front page. But, you know, parapsychologists don't go out there. Parapsychologists won't go and attack people. I just made a comment on YouTube about complete fraud. He was talking about Houdini and the great uh, Conan Doyle misquoting things on a parapsychologist's channel, and he defended him. When we all know what the truth is, Houdini's widow stated that the uh, psychic who told her what Houdini's secret message was, was right. Two weeks later, when the claws of the evil scum, known as theatrical and the parapsychologists, the debunkers and skeptics got their claws into her, uh, threatening, I'm assuming, to take money from whatever royalties he had coming to him, she changed her story. Oh, isn't that interesting? After verifying it. Well, what is it? We know what that truth is. Why would she verify this if it wasn't true? Oh, and she was an emotional woman who was kind of in love with it. Oh, come on. The stories start again. Here we go again, people. It's all the same. It always will be and nothing changes. 
The facts are here. There's a huge library done scientifically by an independent person of great intelligence. It's all sitting there. It has been there for a hundred years now and compounded on top of these already fine studies that were compiled at a time of great involvement in this area. More and more has come out in modern times. So mediumship, which was already verified in the 1920s, was again verified in 2020 or 2018 uh, by another researcher. We verified the verified, and that is never going to be good enough because things never change.